my dear little grandchildren flashed in front of my mind. Now I pray for them every day. It's kind of hard going through the Christmas season, first time in more than 40 years without Judy. So uh, if I break down every now and then, just, just forgive me, just ignore it. <laughs> Keep on grieving. I'll get back in the saddle. All right, let's take our Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a moment ago. In Exodus chapter 6, today looking at verses 9 through 13, you recall that as we were looking at these verses immediately preceding those verses that I read today, and I read those verses again for you, verses 1 through 8, uh, we saw that some very important theological doctrines are set forth by the ten I wills that God makes in those preceding verses. Now, two of those ten I wills are repeated. They're in there twice, so it looks like there are twelve of them. But there are actually ten different specific promises that God gives to Israel as a nation in those verses, verses 1 through 8. And as we were looking at those things, we talked about the two covenants that are mentioned. The covenant in verse 4, which is the covenant of the land, sometimes called the Palestinian covenant, probably not the best name to use uh, in light of the Palestinian conflict going on today. Uh, and then the Abrahamic covenant, which is mentioned in verse 5, two separate and distinct covenants, both of them made to Israel. And so that opened up the question for us, is the church Israel? And we started by looking at all the references to the term Israel in the New Testament. Most of those references, as you know, are in the writings of the Apostle Paul. We learned three keys to Bible interpretation. And this covers everything. I hope that you hang on to these. There's actually a fourth key, but I'll mention that in a moment. There are three keys so far that we have studied concerning Bible interpretation that you can apply to every passage of Scripture that you are studying throughout the Bible. Key number one was always look at the context of any proof text that somebody is trying to prove something with. Look at the context to see if it is being used as the writer of Scripture intended it. Uh, we looked at the context of Romans 9 and we saw the first five verses uh, clearly repudiate the replacement theologians who ripped rip verse 6 out of context trying to make Israel into the church. We saw that real Jews are being talked about in Romans chapter 9. The second key principle that we studied was the one that the replacement theologians often ignore, those who say that the church has replaced Israel. And that key principle, which is stated in many places in the Bible, is what's called the remnant principle. God has always kept a remnant of believers unto himself, no matter how bad the rest of the world has become. And Paul uses the illustration of Elijah, who's complaining and says, look, I'm the only one left alive that really is true to you. And God says, quit bellyaching, Elijah. I've got 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. God always keeps out a remnant. You can see that all the way through the Old Testament. You see it restated for us in the New Testament uh, in many different places. Um, God has not cast away his people, says the Apostle Paul in Romans 11.1, 1, for I'm an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God uses the Jewish people, and that is one of the biggest and clearest illustrations in all of the word of God. He uses the Jewish people to prove his point that he always saves out a remnant. Romans 11.5, even so then at this present time there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And that brought us to the sovereign plan of God which is judging the nation of Israel was actually a blessing to us as Gentiles so that we might be saved. But that doesn't mean that God has cast away the Jews forever because Paul concludes chapter 11 by telling us that there is coming a day when Israel will be brought back into God's blessing as a nation because verse 29 says, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. And that brought us to our third principle which is a very important principle of Bible interpretation, which is Scripture interprets Scripture. Scripture interprets Scripture. If something's taught in one passage of the Bible, it'll be confirmed elsewhere. It never disagrees with itself. So in looking at the other passages where Paul used the term Israel, we learned five things. Number one, we saw that Paul stated that the Mosaic Law, that is the covenant at Mount Sinai with national Israel, that covenant law was abolished. You are not under the law, but you are under grace. Your motivation is not Mount Sinai, but your relationship to Christ through the indwelling Holy Spirit. 
Many in reform circles try to put you back under the law because they view Israel as the church. That's really the key issue here. If the church is not Israel, you're not under the law. If the church is Israel, you're under the law. But Paul tells us that the law, he called it a ministration of death in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7. But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel, that's Jews, could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not look steadfastly to the end of that which is abolished. It can't be any clearer than that. The entire New Testament gives the contrast between the principle of law and grace. That was the second thing that we learned. For example, John 1.17, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. The third thing that we learned under that context was grace and faith are always contrasted with law and works. Romans 4.16, therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to that which is of the law, that's the national Jews to whom the law was given, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. And that includes the Gentiles who've trusted in Jesus. Romans 5.20 Moreover the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Or chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Not being under the law does not mean that you can be a libertine. Not being under the law does not mean that you can do whatever you want to do. No, you are controlled now by a higher principle. You are controlled by love, not law. You are controlled not by the flesh, which tries to keep the law somewhat meticulously, but always fails. No, you are under the control of the power of the Holy Spirit of God, who enables you to do what is right and pleasing to Christ because you love him, not merely because you're trying to keep a set of rules. The fourth thing that we learned was the law is totally unable to be the guiding principle of the Christian life. Galatians 2.21, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. You cannot make yourself righteous either unto salvation or unto sanctification by the law. It doesn't work. It's a standard that proves you're a sinner. We know that the law is good, says Paul, if a man use it lawfully knowing that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murders of fathers, for murders of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. You're not under the law. It's made for the man who is not righteous. But if you're in Christ, you're righteous, not by your own works. Law and work go over here. You're made righteous because of the blood of Jesus Christ. You now have a new motivation, love, instead of the motivation of law. You now have a new power instead of the power of the flesh. You've got the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit of God. If you are a believer, dear people, are you? Do you know it for sure? The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. If you're saved, you have the witness of the Holy Spirit in you that lets you know that you belong to Christ. I hope you have that. But you have eternal security and that you know it, not infernal insecurity. How important it is to know for sure that you're saved. If you've trusted Jesus Christ alone, if you are relying upon him alone for your salvation, you are eternally secure and God's spirit will bear witness with your spirit that you are the child of God. Oh, how I pray that is true for you. I know that's true for me. I settled that issue when I was a little child. And every time that there has been a, a wobble in my life, Lord, am I really saved? I come back to the truth of God's word. God never lies. And he promised that if I trusted in Jesus Christ alone for my salvation, I would have, present tense, the gift of eternal life. And the verse we just read out of Romans chapter 11. We know the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. God doesn't change. He gives us eternal life. Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my hand. Dear people, you can't pluck yourself out. The devil can't pluck you out. Nobody else can pluck you out. If you are safe in the hand of Jesus, you're safe. And you're safe for eternity. That is a wonderful, glorious truth of Scripture. And it's not based on the law. The law condemns you. It's based on the grace of God, which we do not deserve, 
and yet God has extended it freely to us while we were sinners Jesus Christ died for us magnificent truths of the Word of God well I, I started preaching got off my uh, <laughs> notes let's go back to where we were so uh, then uh, we looked at the second big passage used by replacement theologians what about the Israel of God in Galatians chapter 6 verse 16 we saw the analysis of that passage is exactly the same as Romans chapters 9 10 and 11 it's genuine real national Israel that we're talking about and it's talking about the remnant principle in its context and it does not say that Israel is the church that verse that says as many as walk according to this rule peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God that is that remnant that group of Jews who have truly believed and God has always kept a group of the remnant all the way through human history no matter what the devil has done to Israel as a nation Paul made it clear that being Jewish is not what saves you we read Philippians chapter 3 in relation to that that brought us to the important doctrine last week of the new covenant and how it applies to us a very important promise out of the book of Jeremiah Jeremiah chapter 31 we read that passage in Jeremiah chapter 31 and it's clear that we today the New Testament also mentions the New Covenant in Hebrews chapter 8 that we today have entered into the benefits of the New Covenant the New Covenant passages none of them say that Israel is the church or that the church is Israel but it says that we in the church have entered into the benefits of that New Covenant so we read that passage in Jeremiah 31 and uh, if you recall that's verses 31 through 40 where Jeremiah prophesies the new covenant with Israel and it's a future covenant in Jeremiah 31 it hasn't been made with Israel as a nation yet but Jeremiah says there's gonna come a day when God's gonna make this new covenant with the nation of Israel and he says the only way to make that covenant void if you will read the entire passage all the way through verse 40 I think I stopped at verse 36 last week but if you read it all the way through verse 40 the only way to make the new covenant void is to destroy the sun the moon and all of the stars and then after you've done that you have to be able to measure the entire heavens and the earth that's what Jeremiah says he says the only way that God will ever annul that covenant it's made with national Israel now look can anybody destroy the sun moon stars and measure all of the heavens and all of the earth <laughs> no so that means that's a covenant that will never be broken and God made it to a nation to national Israel then we read Ephesians chapter 2 verses 12 through 18 and learned that we have entered into the benefits of the new covenant without becoming Jews and while Israel becoming the church you don't have to become a Jew to enter into the benefits of the new covenant the church is a new grouping composed of Jews and Samaritans and Gentiles and other half-breeds and all of us in here are probably half-breeds we learned that we have now entered the household of God what that promise says it uses that term the household of God not by the covenant at Mount Sinai built upon the law but by means of the new covenant built upon the apostles and prophets with Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone we saw that the new covenant as a covenant with national Israel is specifically restated in the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 8 for finding fault with them he saith, behold the days come saith the Lord when I will make a new covenant with who the house of Israel and with the house of Judah okay now tell me which half of the, of the church is the house of Israel and which half of the church is the house of Judah it's not in other words the book of Hebrews reaffirms what Jeremiah said about national Israel composed of the northern ten tribes and the southern two tribes the house of Israel and the house of Judah it's made to them and it's quoted that way in Hebrews chapter 8 verse 8 for this is my covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days saith the Lord I will put my laws into their minds and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people he's quoting Jeremiah chapter 31 and all of that we noted in conclusion last week was because national Israel and the sovereign plan of God was disciplined and temporarily set aside God opened the door of salvation to the Gentiles that's Romans 9 and even during the time of chastening God continued to save out a remnant of believing Jews that's Romans 10 but God still has a future plan for national Israel in the literal tribulation and millennium because of his promises to Abraham and the Jewish people through Isaac and Jacob that's Romans 11 I just gave you a summary of the three chapters of Romans and as I said once before probably the fastest time you've ever heard Romans 9 10 and 11 preached in your life and certainly the fastest I've ever preached it Ephesians 2 makes it clear that we as Gentiles have entered into the benefits of the new covenant through the blood of Christ which was infinite in its scope unlike the limited blood sacrifices of the Old Testament I gave the practical illustration of what it means to be in the same household 
We're in the same household of God as Israel is, but being in the household of God does not make the church Israel, just like having a second child in the family does not turn the second child into the first child. Two children can enter into the same benefits of the same household, but some things will be different for each. We talked about girls versus boys. Just because a girl is born into the same household does not make her into a boy just because she has an older brother. Her parents may buy her dresses and perfume and jewelry, but for their son they will never buy dresses and perfume and jewelry unless they're really weird parents. And I don't know, there are some people in the United States like that right now. I don't know if you've been following what's going on in the courts, but um, up in New England there's a... A kid, he was born a boy, and uh, when he was six, he decided he wanted to be a girl. And so his parents have been dressed him like a girl, and they've let him grow his long hair, and they have been suing in court so that he can go and use the girl's restroom and not be ostracized. I mean, they are people. There are some weird parents. <laughs> That's replacement theology! That's what replacement theology tries to do. It tries to tell you that Israel is a church and the church is Israel. Just like the parents have a girl, but they say it's going to be the boy. You know, we dress him like a boy. A girl who wants to be like a boy, so they dress him macho. Dress her macho. Do you understand? I mean, that in the practical realm is what the replacement theologians are trying to do in the theological realm. And so that brought us to the fourth key, which I'd mentioned the first three. Now here's number four. In Bible interpretation, the solution to the imagined problem is simple, unless you are told in the text that something is symbolic, like the book of Revelation tells you that you're going to use symbols. Take the Bible at text, Bible text at face value. Israel means Israel. The church means the church. Both are part of the household of God. But they're different, just like sons are different from daughters, and different sons are different from one another as well. But they're all part of the same household and all have different blessings, experiences, gifts, talents, opportunities, obligations, although some of the things in each of those categories will be the same, just like a lot of my kids look like me and the ones who are good looking look like my wife. <laughs> okay, and then we answered that final challenge last week. We looked at that one miscellaneous passage where the term church is used in our English Bibles. Uh, where the context is clearly the Jews, that passage from Acts 7, which is Stephen's sermon just before he gets stoned to death. And in verse 38 he said, This is he which was in the church in the wilderness, with the angel which spake unto him in Mount Sinai, and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. And you remember that context. He's talking about Moses and the children of Israel in the wilderness wanderings. And so <clears throat> there are some, though not the informed replacement theologians, but there are some who are exuberant and don't know much Greek, um, who will try to use that passage and say, see, the church is Israel, because it says so right here, the church in the wilderness. Um, we know that that passage is not usually cited by careful replacement theologians to prove their point, even though they would love to use it, because they know the underlying Greek text can answer that problem. The church, word church here is the same word, the Greek word ekklesia, that is used for the church throughout the entire rest of the New Testament. It's the common word for the church, but that's not the whole story. You can't just give half of the story. You don't cite facts selectively. Remember, that brings us back to those first and third principles of Bible interpretation that we learned. Number one, always read things in their context. You try to pull that verse out of its context, you're in trouble. Number two, Scripture interprets Scripture. That was the third principle that I gave you. Scripture interprets Scripture, which means you look at the rest of Scripture to see if that fits what else is going on. And so we looked at Acts chapter 19, that's written by the same author, that's Luke, that's in the same book of the Bible, uh, that's the book of Acts, it's just a few chapters later, and we saw that the word ecclesia is used for an assembly of pagan idol makers under the leadership of Demetrius who wanted to kill Paul. That's definitely not either a local church or the church universal. Luke, who wrote Acts 7, recorded the speech of Stephen before he was stoned, used that same word three times, ecclesia to describe a mob in Acts 19, because ecclesia means a called out assembly. Stephen used the term ecclesia in Acts 7 because he's referring to the assembly of people that God called out of Egypt, and ecclesia is a called out assembly. Acts 19, it's a called out assembly called out by Demetrius. Who gave the calling and how is the word being used in its context? So trying to use that passage in Acts 7 to prove that the church is Israel is disingenuous at best and for someone who knows better it's dishonest. Reputable theologians do not 
uh, used that argument even if they want to prove that Israel is the church. Finally, we saw that Israel is not found in James, first and second Peter, first, second, third John or Jude. The term Israel is found three times in Revelation always refers to national Israel in the future. So answering the question, uh, is the church Israel or is Israel the church? The answer is no. So that brings us to this passage that we have before us today. And that's important for us to have as the background for what happens now in verses 9 through 13. Moses spake so unto the children of Israel, but they hearkened not unto Moses for anguish of spirit and for cruel bondage. Now, what did God just told him to do? He said, go and talk to the children of Israel. And as we saw at the end of those few verses that we read at the beginning, verses 1 through 8, Moses went and did what he was told. So uh, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Go in, speak unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, that he let the children of Israel go out of his land. And Moses spake before the Lord, saying, Behold, the children of Israel have not hearkened unto me. How then shall Pharaoh hear me, who am of uncircumcised lips? Moses did what he told. He went and talked to the children of Israel. And they wouldn't listen to him. Why? Because they were in pain. They hearkened not unto Moses for anguish of spirit, and cruel bondage. Remember the first time Moses went in, Pharaoh said, hey, they must be lazy. They want to have a vacation. I'll show them what it's all about. And he made their task more difficult. He took away their straw from them. They had to go out and gather stubble to make their own straw. And yet he did not decrease the number of bricks that they had to make. So what Moses did the first time, he obeyed God. He went and dropped to Pharaoh. And it made things worse for the children of Israel. They'd been all excited. First, when Moses comes out of the wilderness and Moses says, I've met with God. I was here at the burning bush. Here's what God said. He's going to deliver you out of Egypt. You're my people. And they said, oh man, this is wonderful. And they bowed down and they worshipped him. Remember the end of the last chapter? That's what was going on at the end of the last chapter. They were all excited. And so Moses is all enthused and he goes into Pharaoh. He's feeling real good. God's going to do something powerful here. And he gives the message from God. And Pharaoh sneers. He laughs. He turns his nose and says, make their work harder. Not exactly the results that Moses was expecting. And now it's so bad that when he goes back to the children of Israel again, after God has given him those ten great, I will do this, and three times says, I am the Lord, I am Jehovah. They're going to know me by my name, Jehovah, the covenant-keeping God. Two covenants are mentioned. And now he says, okay, I know they didn't listen to you. So I want you to go back to Pharaoh again. That doesn't make much sense, does it? From the human perspective, it sure doesn't make much sense. But let's think about what's going on here for a moment. The devil knows that the perspective of an unregenerate man will always be clouded by physical pain. Let me say that again. The devil knows that the perspective of an unregenerate man will always be clouded by physical pain. When he's starting to hurt, he doesn't think straight, to put it simply. A lot of us, when we're hurting, don't think straight. Instead of turning that unregenerate toward God, you know that it'll often make a person curse God and turn away. That's the reason that pagans always slap you in the face with that question. If God is all good and powerful, why is there pain and suffering in the world? Have any of you ever heard something along that line? Yeah, yeah. I hear it all the time. Anytime I talk to somebody, I mean, that is one of the popular questions, and I do try to share Christ with all kinds of people every place I go. Um, but that is one of the things that they always hit you with, especially in light of all the chaos and things going on like Ebola plague you know that was a big question well, did God make Ebola you know people do you know the answers are you able to answer what if they come up to you and say if God is all good and all powerful why are children dying of cancer or if God is all good and all powerful why do bad things happen to good people of course there are a lot of false assumptions in that but why do uh, bad things happen to good people or on a more personal level if God is all good and all powerful why did my wife get cancer? Or if God is all good and all powerful, why did my child die? I have a friend with whom I graduated from high school many, many, many years ago. In fact, <laughs> that was back in the days when you were still, you know, chipping away caves to live in kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, I have a friend who had his only child hit by a car and killed as a tiny little toddler, and he's turned his back on God. 
These are real questions that real people are asking in the real world out there. Why did my child die? Or, if God is so good and all-powerful, why do I have to suffer this terrible arthritis? I'm not such a bad person that I should have to suffer all of this. Have you ever run into that kind of questions? If you live at all in this world and have any contact with unbelievers, you're going to run into those questions. But in contrast to that, the true man or woman of faith will flee to the refuge found in Christ. When we are faced with pain, with suffering, when death stares us in the face, we flee to Christ. We know the answer. And the answer is very simple. Pain and suffering and death are not because God is evil or because God is impotent or because God is careless. Pain and suffering and death are in the world because of three reasons. Do you know these answers when people challenge you with it? Don't let them get off track. Bring them back because this is the point at which a man comes under conviction of sin and then looks to Christ for salvation. If you don't have starting point number one, you cannot get them to the final conclusion that trusting in Christ gives salvation. Here are the three reasons. Number one, our first parents, Adam and Eve, sinned and so pain and suffering and death entered into the world. Do you understand why the devil pushes evolution so hard? He knows that you have to start here in your witnessing. If we all just sort of happened to come into existence, if some blob of goo in some primordial soup just got together and lightning bolt went zap and hit it, and it went gabooka ba gabooka ba gabooka ba, you know, and started to blubber, and then that turned into something else, you know, from goo to the zoo, and then to you. <laughs> Dear folks, the devil knows what he's doing when he pushes that so hard in our schools. Because you have to start with sin entering into the world. And the Bible says it entered with Adam and Eve. Whereas by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for they all have sinned. Romans 5.19. Do you understand it? That's why Satan pushes it so hard. Because he knows you can't witness if you've got that roadblock in the mind of somebody else who doesn't believe that there was an Adam and Eve and there was a literal fall. That's point number one. Pain and suffering death in the world because of three reasons. Number one, our parents, Adam and Eve, sinned and so pain, suffering and death entered in the world. Number two, we, that is we, all of us, sinned in and with Adam and Eve because we were in their genetic offspring when they sinned. That's the doctrine of federal headship. That's the reason that one man just like Adam was one man, why Christ is called the second Adam. There's a parallel. Paul makes it very clearly. Oh, I tell you, the gospel hinges on this because it's 1 Corinthians 15. There is a second Adam. One man, Jesus Christ, can make us righteous through faith in his finished work at Calvary. You can become in Christ just like you are in Adam. You see, Satan has got you at point number two. If you can't articulate this, if you don't have answers for these folks who claim that, well, we are just a bunch of glop, and we're here as a blip on the radar screen of eternity, and then we disappear, and there's no more after that. We were in Adam. We participated in his sin. We were part of Adam. We were in his loins, the scripture says, when he sinned, which meant that he, being a perfect man, no thing clouding his mind, he made a willful choice when Eve offered him fruit. She was deceived. The Bible says that. Paul tells Timothy that. She was deceived. But Adam walked into it with his eyes wide open, and he took it and he ate in direct disobedience to what God told him. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. That's point number two. Point number three. 
we are all individually sinners. We've all made choices to sin at some point in our lives, all of us, millions of times probably. We are stinking, we are filthy in the sight of a truly holy God, no matter how good we think ourselves to be. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. None of us deserve to live. We have all committed the capital offense before a holy and perfect and righteous God. We all deserve the death penalty and that's why we all die. Three reasons. If you can't get past number one, you can't get to the gospel. The gospel is 1 Corinthians chapter three and, uh, verses 3 and 4, 15, 3 and 4, or Romans chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Christ died for our what? Sins. sins. You see, if you can't establish the sin point, you can't answer the question of why is there pain and suffering and death in the world and why do get people get cancer and why do little kids get killed and all these other big, big things that they throw out there and try to glop it all up so that it makes you feel like oh, you're really inferior and you Christians don't have any answers. It's because of sin. Until a man is convinced that he is a sinner, he will not need a savior. So little is preached on sin anymore. It's all this feel-good kind of theology that you get out there. You know, you're okay and I'm okay and everybody's okay and let's just sort of all muddle along. It doesn't work that way, folks. The reason Christ is the answer, he's the answer to a specific problem. And the problem is sin. That is in our text here today. The true man or woman of faith flees to the refuge of Christ and the reason for pain and suffering and death. And these people are going through pain. They hearken not unto Moses for the anguish of spirit and for cruel bondage. They're suffering pain. But it's hard for them to hear the answer when they're going through the pain. It's hard for a lot of us to hear the answer when we're going through the pain. Don't let those challenges from the world go unanswered. Be ready, as Peter tells us, to give a reason for the hope that lies within you with meekness and with fear. Point three, often before giving a solution empowered by the Spirit of God instead of the solution that we want, which is empowered by the flesh, instead of giving it to us immediately, God allows us to get to the breaking point. You think they were at the breaking point? I think they were. Have you ever been at a point where you felt like you were at a breaking point? I've been. I suspect all of us have been there at some point. God allows us to get to the breaking point so that we have nowhere else to turn except Him. We can be thankful that God pushes us to the end of our rope. Because if He left us too much rope, we'd hang ourselves. He pushes us to the end of our rope so that we have nowhere else to turn except to Him. You know, when God does that, it accomplishes at least six things. Three things for believers, three things for unbelievers. Number one, for the believer, when we reach the end of our rope, here are the three things it does for us. Number one, it increases our faith. Oh, we've talked about that in detail, but I hope you remember those lessons, both, old, both in the morning services and the evening service. We've talked about how God uses the difficult circumstances of life to increase our faith, to teach us to trust Him more, to take the next step by faith. Instead of having always the support system out there to rely on, we have to trust Him. Number one, it increases our faith. Number two, for the believer, it shows us that life really is less valuable here than eternal life. It gives us a clearer understanding of the value of eternal things over the value of temporal things. When you're pushed to the limit, you suddenly begin to realize what's important and what things are not important. Let me give you a, a real dumbed-down illustration. Suppose you knew that in exactly one year, 365 days from now, the communists were going to invade the United States and take over. Okay, you got that in your mind. And at the same time, the Muslims were all going to come and 
blow up Washington, D.C., and every big city in the United States, including Philadelphia, right across the river from us. And at the same time, bioterrorists were going to come from Africa and spread Ebola in every city of the United States. Now you got 365 days to do something about that. So what would you do? Would you kneel down and pray for 365 days that God would stop these terrible events so that the gospel of Christ could reach those nations? Or would you say, let's see, how much have I got in savings? Uh, let's see, I wonder if I could buy a piece of property. I know these things are going to happen in the United States, but they're not going to happen in Canada. Uh, or it's just the continental United States. I know I could get a piece of property up in Alaska someplace. Or I could move to Mexico. Or I've got some friends who live in Brazil. Actually, my brother has, has family. His wife's mother lives in Brazil. Hey, I'll go run to Brazil. We would try to solve the problem ourselves, wouldn't we? Suppose you heard, in 30 minutes, all of those same things are going to happen. And you have nowhere to go. You've got a wife and children, and perhaps grandchildren. You got 30 minutes. Would it suddenly change your perspective on what things were important to try to rescue? What things you'd try to pack into a suitcase? Whether or not you'd try to get your bank account and buy a piece of property in Canada? You see, when the crises of life hit, when God brings us to the end of our rope, when we don't have anywhere else to turn, he pulls us back to himself, doesn't he? That's what God is going to be doing here in this text. The third thing, number one, was it increases our faith. Number two, it gives us a clearer understanding of the value of eternal things over temporal things. Number three, it allows the believer to manifest forth the fragrance of Christ by the way in which we respond. It gives us the opportunity to manifest forth the fragrance of Christ by the way in which we respond. Those are the three things that coming to the end of the rope does for the believer. But there are three things also for the unbeliever. Number one, when God puts the unbeliever in those terrible situations, it gets their attention that temporal solutions never work. Oh, there may be a patch for a while, but temporal, solu uh, temporal solutions to problems never work. Number two, it shows the unbeliever that life really is going to end in death. And it may be soon. And number three, for the unbeliever, it gives an opportunity to open their hearts and minds to the true solutions that God has to offer. Now, some of them do and some of them don't. But it gives them the opportunity to face reality, to face eternity, to make a decision. And yes, I know the doctrine of election is out there. And I believe it with all my heart. But I also know that God has made a free offer of the gospel. And that opportunity, it makes them alert to that fact. That there may be a God, and he may have an answer to the problem. You know, the problems don't go away when we respond properly, as Christians are supposed to do. But a proper response does give us a clear focus on the divine perspective of time and eternity, the things that really matter. The next lesson in our text here is really for leaders who are called by God. And you know, every one of us are. I say, but I'm not a pastor. No, you're not, but you are a leader called by God. <laughs> you're out there supposed to be calling others to Christ. So here's a lesson for all of us. Don't be surprised when people don't respond to the message God has sent you to bring if they're facing difficult personal problems. Have you ever witnessed anybody and they say, look, I don't have time for that? Anybody you've ever witnessed who told you they didn't have time for it? Or said, look, I got some really heavy stuff on my plate right now. I mean, you know, just, you know, don't talk to me about that stuff right now. I'm, I'm facing this and I'm facing this and I'm facing this. You know, maybe we can talk about it next week or something, but not now. Have you ever faced that? I have. Try to talk to people and that's how they respond to you. 
So here's a lesson from our text. Don't be surprised when people don't respond to the message God has sent you to bring if they're facing difficult personal problems. You know, the problems can be any kind of problems. The problems might be financial. They might be emotional. They might be health-related. They might be family-related. They might be work-related. They might be goal-related. They might be comfort-related. They might be friendship-related. They might be enemy-related. They might be true love-related. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know all that stuff. Too, but, man, I'm in love. I don't want to think about that. I want to think about love. Oh, man, in college, I tried to talk to some kids, and they were like that. They might be parent-related, they might be child-related, or they might be, as in our text, they might be government-related. Hey, problems come from the government, too. <laughs> you didn't know that, did you? Whatever the case, crisis situations often take first place in our thought processes, and we're not interested in the theological answer. It's our crisis that's up front. We don't want a theological answer to that, even if the answer is right. When there's a crisis, we want a pragmatic answer, and we want it now. That's what Moses is facing. That's the problem he has here. The text says, Moses spake so unto the children of Israel. He did just what God told him. But they hearkened not unto Moses for anguish of spirit and for cruel bondage. They had a problem. They weren't interested in theology. You know, the next issue that we see here in the text, the next lesson, is even worse for the leader. Because, I mean, here's basically what Moses says to God. If my people won't listen and... God says, well, yeah, your people won't listen. So now what I want you to do is I want you to go back to the source of the problem. The source that made it worse on my people when you went in the first time. <laughs> in our way of human reasoning, that doesn't make sense. If what we did the first time was the catalyst that brought on the pain and suffering, why should we do it again? And why should we make it worse? It's an important principle to remember here. Our job is just to obey. Our job is not to argue. Our job is to obey. As the poem says, ours is not to reason why. Ours is but to do and die. Don't argue with God. Do what God tells you to do. And leave the results up to God. We don't like that, but that's true. Number seven, we've already seen at the burning bush in Exodus chapter three that Moses tended to have a problem with arguing with God. <laughs> that was part of his character. That ugly habit is rearing itself here again in the text. Verse 12, Moses spake before the Lord saying, Behold, the children of Israel have not hearkened unto me. How then shall Pharaoh hear me who have uncircumcised lips? You know, before he's talking about his tongue. I can't stutter by my I can't stop the heart. I feel like I can hardly talk at all, God. God said to him, Who made your tongue? Well now he's gotten off the tongue, now he's got to his lips. <laughs> How am I gonna go to Pharaoh? Look at my lips, Lord. God could have said to him, Moses, we've been through this conversation before. Who made your lips? I think Moses probably picked up on that. But you know, what is happening here in this verse is that God is reminding us all that we're under authority. In some sphere, some place, we are under authority. One of the things that God hates most is when we show our rebellion through arguing with those whom he has placed in authority over us. Young people, do you argue with your parents when your will crosses their will? If you really believe that your parents are not in the will of God, the way to handle it is to pray and to ask God to open their eyes to his will. And you might add that he would open your eyes to his will also. Because you might both be wrong. Opening our eyes to the will of the Father. The answer is not to argue and to rebel. We could say the same thing for our work situations for governmental authorities. You know, if you've been in the evening services with us, we've covered many different principles about how to handle commands and prohibitions by authority figures when those commands or prohibitions are contrary to the Word of God. So I encourage you, get out your notes sometime this week, review those lessons, because that will be very helpful to you as we go through the various things that Moses and Aaron do 
when they're confronting Pharaoh. I'm not going to preach those sermons again, which I covered a lot of stuff in the evening service on that. I mean, humongous number of principles from all over the Word of God that deal with that specific issue. Get out your notes and look them over before we get into the plagues. Number eight. I want you to note a startling contrast also, and I see we're out of time here, so I'll try to make this quick. Probably won't make it all the way through, but I'll just give you this. Number eight, notice the contrast. Moses argues with God right after, immediately in the text, right after God has spoken his ten great I will statements. That's when Moses argues. When God says what he's going to do to Pharaoh, and what he's going to do to and for Israel. Moses bases his argument on the failure of Israel, even though God has promised to destroy Pharaoh. That's a non sequitur. God has just promised he's going to nail Pharaoh. He says, but the people of Israel didn't listen to me. Who cares? What I just promised I was going to do is I'm going to show Pharaoh what I will do. I am the Lord. Moses has missed the point. How often do we miss the point as well. Our text today follows immediately on those statements by God. One note of interest. There are ten I will promises. As we said before, two are stated twice. Those promises concerning the land and concerning the heritage. God is making a point about the land and the heritage, which is why we covered so many weeks talking about the covenant of the land and why there is still a future promise for national Israel. God says both those things twice in that set of I wills. There are ten plagues. There are ten commandments. Oh, we don't have time for this. But 10 is a very interesting number if you track it through the history of Israel. And the final lesson today, God always provides the necessary assistance, even if only weak and faltering, and Aaron was indeed weak and faltering, to get his plan moving forward. God will still deal with his people as well as with recalcitrant persecutors of his people. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, and gave them a charge unto the children of Israel and unto Pharaoh king of Egypt to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. He gave him assistance. He gave him his brother. And then he sent him back, not just to Pharaoh, but he says, this charge is both for Israel because I'm not giving up on them. How thankful we are God doesn't give up on us. Oh, I hope you're thankful. Boy, I'm thankful God doesn't give up on me. I am such a failure so many times in my life, and I look back with shame at it, and I say, Lord, how in the world did I miss the point? Moses missed the point. God didn't give up on Moses. How many times did I cry out in pain, and you still came to my aid? That's what was happening to the children of Israel. God still loved them. There is coming a day of reckoning and judgment when the Lord, the righteous judge of all the earth, will deliver his own. We see that in Revelation 19. We'll not go there today. We don't have time. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power, for the joy and delight that we have in Jesus Christ, our great God and Savior. How we thank you, Father, for the promises that are yea and amen. How we thank you that you are a God who is there, a God who cares, a God who directs our steps who orders our paths so that you might receive the greatest amount of glory, so that we might learn to trust you and walk by faith, so that we might receive the greatest amount of good as we walk by faith and see you accomplishing that which is humanly impossible. The law could never accomplish it. The flesh could never accomplish it. But your grace accomplishes it by faith. Thank you, Father. Take your word and use it in our hearts to the glory of Jesus Christ, your Son. For we pray it in his name. Amen. Our closing hymn today is hymn number 264, Break Forth, O Beauteous Heavenly Light.